This is the last message in the series, The Blessed Life. And this is the second most important message to me. The most important message is the one I call the principle of first. And it's about putting God first in every area of your life, but also your finances. Uh, and it's a principle. And principles you can live by. And this is called the principles of multiplication. And I say principles plural because there are two. It's just two principles. But I'm gonna share with you how God can multiply your peace, your joy, um, your, your relationship with others, with him. He can restore, but he can also multiply your finances. So he's not just a God of addition, he's a God of multiplication. And let me just ask you this question. Every campus, every gathering, everyone online, would it be all right with you if God multiplied your finances. <laughs> Let be okay? Okay, I'm just wondering, because some of you didn't say yes, so okay, it's all right, you know, if you don't want to multiply it. But I'm talking about so you could help people, so you can minister to people. And God doesn't mind if your kids get to go to a better school. He doesn't mind that. He doesn't mind if they need braces, that you have the finances to give them braces. He doesn't mind that you can help them go to the school that they want to go to when they graduate or that you can help them buy their first home or you can, uh, like Debbie, you can buy unbelievable gifts for our grandchildren <laughs> constantly and consistently and um, <laughs> extravagantly. Anyway, so that's a whole nother topic, but it's okay. It's okay as long as you keep your priorities straight. But I just want to show you how God in Scripture multiplied five loaves and two fish and the principles. There are just two principles. You live by these principles, you can see whatever resources you have multiplied to feed multitudes, all right? So uh, it's the funniest message in the series, so you're gonna have a lot of fun. And then at the end of the message, I share how Debbie and I got started on this journey. Uh, of, of giving extravagantly. And we've been living this way um, ever since. And uh, I, just, I just have to say, because you might not know, um, you know, the blessed life, uh, I don't know how many languages in, it's in now, I have no idea how many copies it sold, but we gave all the resources of the blessed life to Gateway Church. And because of that, and because of the other books, somewhere around year five, of the church, so, so far the church is 23 years old, so about 18 out of 23 years, Debbie and I have been able to give the equivalency of our salary back to the church. We've never taken a dime from the radio ministry, we've never taken a dime from the television ministry, we've never passed the plate here, and for most of the time we've been here, we've been able to give our salary back. So here's, it doesn't cost you anything to have me here. That's not a bad deal, okay? <laughs> but why wouldn't God give resources to givers? Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he give resources? Think about it. Here's God with all the money in the world and all the money if there's money outside of the world. You know, God owns Mars too. So all, all the money, all the resources over here all of the people who need the gospel, all the missionaries that need to be sent, all the orphanages that need to be built, all the people that need to be fed, all the people that need clean water, all the people that need to hear about Jesus Christ, all the need, all the resources. Another way to say is all the supply, all the demand, if you're in business, okay? Have you ever thought about what's in the middle? You are, you're in the middle. And God will give you some resources and see what you do with them. And he doesn't mind you keeping 90%. That's a lot for yourself, 90%. If you just funnel 10% to these people who really need the gospel, think about that. And so when you're faithful, then he gives you more. Then he gives you more. Until one day, you're a pastor 
My father was a, in business, owned a company. I could have done anything. I could have gone into business. But I said, I'm going to go into ministry. Pastor, never thought about, you know, gave up this thing of being successful financially. And now, please hear me when I say this. God has funneled millions of dollars through Debbie and me to people who need it. And yet we never chased it or never went after it. And he's funneled millions of dollars through Gateway Church to the kingdom. Do you realize you give over $20 million a year to missions? I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So here's God with all the resources. Here's all the need. How's he going to get the resources there except give some resources to some person and see if he or she will be faithful. And then he can multiply their resources. So here are the two principles of multiplication from this very famous story, Luke chapter nine, beginning verse 12. When the day began to wear away, the 12, that's the disciples, came and said to him, that's Jesus, while he's preaching now, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place here. In other words, there aren't any restaurants close or stores. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Now, I just want you to notice something. Maybe you've never noticed. Notice the word men. 5,000 men. What you might not know is in that day, the way they counted crowds was they only counted the men. The reason was because most were married, most were married at a young age, and so they were actually counting families. The average for each family was the average, depending on age now, was four to five children. So when we say the feeding of the 5,000, we're talking not about 5,000 people, 5,000 families. So when you take a, a wife, a spouse, and then you take, let's say, four children, now you've got six, so five times six is 30,000 people. Most theologians believe this is the largest crowd Jesus, uh, with whom Jesus ever spoke. Think about that. And matter of fact, let me just prove it to you. Let me just prove it to you. Matthew 14, when Matthew tells a story, he says, now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Where was the, oh, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> I, pr I just proved it to you. There were, there were more than 5,000 people. 25 to 30,000 people were there. All right, then you go back, continuing verse 14, and he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. Just wanted y'all notice it, Jesus, because I love math and Jesus loves math too. All right, and they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate, they all ate and were filled. And 12, notice the word, the number 12, baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Now, a lot of theologians have said the reason there were 12 baskets left over is because this is actually, they were in a region called the region of 12. And there was 12 major cities around it. But I personally don't believe that. I think there were 12 baskets left over because Jesus wanted each disciple to have a doggy bag. That's, that's my personal <laughs> opinion, okay? All right, but here, here's what I just want you to think. I don't know if you've ever done this, but have you ever put yourself in a story in the Bible and thought, how would I have responded had I been there that day? And I don't want you to think about that you've heard the story before. I want you to think about what it actually says, okay? So the first thing you need to think about is it's getting late. Jesus is preaching, and he's been preaching all day. Uh, look, look, look at verse... 12 where we started. It says, when the day began to wear away. You know what that means in the Greek? In the Greek, that means when the day began to wear away. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what a description. 
And so I think the disciples personally kind of formed a little committee, and I think they said, what are we going to do? I mean, I, mean, I mean, this is good, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starving. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to starve to death. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to die right here. Right now, I'm about to die if I don't get something to eat soon. And I think one of the disciples probably said something like, that's it. That's it. Let's tell Jesus that the people are hungry. <laughs> because he seems to care a lot about the people. He doesn't seem to care much about us, but he does care a lot about the people. And so then, one of the disciples goes up to Jesus while he's still teaching. That's the inference from the scriptures. So he's teaching, see Jesus, he's had a podium just like that. I don't know if y'all know if they had those back in the first century, but he had a podium like that. And so he's up there teaching, huge crowd, kind of like today, but even larger than this. And one of the disciples, let's just say you, you're one of the disciples, put yourself in the story. You walk up to Jesus and you say, Lord, excuse me. Excuse me, Lord, excuse me. Um, excuse me. Um, Lord, this has been great. <laughs> I tell you, this series of messages that you're bringing all in one day. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, but Lord, we, we feel like that the people are getting hungry. Now, I could go all night. I was just telling John. I said, John, I could go all night. This is just so good. I tell you, I could go all night. But uh, the, the restaurants, they're about right to close. And we feel like that uh, you should um, just, just wrap it up. <laughs> and Jesus said, you, you, you want me to finish because you think you feel like, y'all feel like your little group kind of feels like that the people are hungry, right? Yes, Lord, it's, it's all about the people. It's all about the people. <laughs> and then he said something. Maybe you've never seen this. I just want you to think about it. This was you. Look, look at verse 13. But he said to them, well, then you give them something to eat. <laughs> I mean, you're in your little group. You're so concerned about them. Why don't you give them something to eat? Think about how you would feel. And you've got to go back and tell them. And they said, well, did you tell them the people were hungry? Yes, that's what I told them. I said, the people are hungry. Well, is he going to dismiss the service? No. Well, what did he say? He said for us to give them something to eat. <laughs> what? Hey, look, at, look at this. There's 30,000 people here. And then there's some little kid that snuck back into town to Long John Silver's. He got the two-piece meal with extra rolls. <laughs> and he's walking by, and you know, one of the disciples grabs it, you know, probably, probably Peter, you know, probably Peter. Think about it. And he probably grabbed one of the rolls and just started eating it. And John probably said, Stop it, stop it, Peter. That's all we have. That's all we have. And then another one probably said, Hey, that's it. Go tell Jesus this is all we have and he'll dismiss the service. Now, I just want you to think just for a moment, if you had never read this in the Bible, and if you had been there that day, and you had a two-piece meal <laughs> with five rolls, don't you think Jesus would have dismissed the service? Just think, just come on, really, think. Well, don't you think? Okay, so you walk up to Jesus again. Lord, excuse me, excuse me. Just one, just, just one other thing, excuse me. Um, you know, a moment ago, I was telling you how good this uh, series is that you're doing. Um, but, um, uh, and you told us, you know, to, um, you know, uh, get the uh, people something to eat. And, um, but Lord, all we have uh, is uh, two, two pieces of fish and um, uh, almost five rolls. Uh, Peter ate some. And, um, <laughs> but, um, um, and Peter, there was a kid, and Peter took it from him. Lord, I didn't take it from him. Peter did. Um, but um, anyway, that's all we have. So we're thinking that we should, you know, like we said a moment ago, we, we're, we took a vote, and we think we should you know, wrap it up. <laughs> and the Lord said, so you have uh, uh, two fish and almost, 
almost five-year-olds. I, I know how Peter is. And, um, and you say, yeah, that's all we have. And so the Lord says, yeah, that'd be great. Have them sit down in groups of 50. Um, Lord, um, we, we don't have a lot of these snack packs. Uh, we just... <laughs> We just have one, and um, yeah, yeah, no, 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 that'll be fine. Now, my personal opinion is, you gotta remember, these guys knew the scriptures. Maybe better than us. When I say the scriptures, that's the Old Testament. The reason is the whole thing is the scriptures now, but then there was no New Testament. They were the New Testament, okay? So they knew the Old Testament, okay? And that's why I love to preach old and new, too because I love the whole thing. It's all scripture. It's all scripture, old and new, okay? But it's all the Bible. But they knew the scriptures. And there's a story where Elijah fed 100 men with 12 loaves of bread. Some of, many of the miracles Jesus did, do you know, are actually in the Old Testament in another way, and he just did them more and greater. So, so it's incredible. If you just go look at the miracles of Jesus sometime and see the analogy of it in the Old Testament, even though it actually happened in the Old Testament. Okay, so here, here is what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if one of them remembered that and said, you know what, I'll bet that when he prays over it, it's gonna multiply right in front of our eyes. And that's what many believers think happened. But do you know that's not what happened? Look, look at verse 16. He blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So think about it. He blessed and broke them. Okay, so Peter might have, you know, grabbed one of the rolls and took it up. Jesus said, here, here, pray over mine first. Pray over mine first. Watch. Watch what happens when he prays over it. Watch. And then Jesus takes this piece of bread, probably, you know, the big round thing, but you know, and, and said, Lord, bless it, breaks it, and hands half of it back to Peter. Uh, are you through praying? Now, he, the Bible doesn't say this, but I just want to take a little license here. What if Jesus had said something like this? I just want you to think about it. Yes, Peter, I've blessed it. Now, you go give it away and see what happens. Can you just think about that for a minute? I've blessed it. It's been blessed by me. You know, Hebrews, now this New Testament, Okay? If you're hung up on that, Hebrews says that when we tithe, Jesus receives our tithes and blesses them. I've blessed it, now you go give it away. And so Peter probably went up to the first person and said something like this. Take just a little piece. <laughs> I mean, what would you have said? Take a little piece, take a little piece. Take a little piece, take a little, you pig, I said a little piece. What is wrong with you? And he gets down to the last person and he's got just a little piece of bread left. Sweat's pouring down his face and right before she reaches to take it, it grows in Peter's hands. See, what you need to get about this story is the miracle did not happen in the master's hands. It happened in the disciples' hands. And it happened when the disciples did what the master told them to do, even though it didn't make sense. All right, so there are two principles of multiplication. They're real simple. Here's number one. It must be blessed before it can multiply. I mean, what if the disciples had just started giving it out without the blessing of Jesus? Never would have multiplied. Do you know I know people who say, well, I do give, I give when God leads me. And I give a little here and I give a little there, but they don't give the first 10% to 
to the house of God, which is what Jesus, and Jesus said when we tithe, again, Hebrews says that Jesus himself receives our tithes. What? I, I know so many people who just have never caught that principle. We had a couple in our church a few years ago when I preached the blessed life, and they thought, we just never tithe. We, we, we've just never been consistent and we've never given the first check. And when we did tithe, we tithed on the net, not the gross. And so they immediately, that day, because we had the offering boxes, not many people gave on, online back then. And so they wrote a check for the full 10% of the gross, put it in the offering box. The next day he goes to work and he gets a, an envelope with a letter in it he had been expecting a bonus he'd been promised like in January, it's not like September. And the company president said, this was brought to my attention that we overlooked this. And because of that, I've doubled the bonus. And he gets it the next day. You will never in a million years convince me that was a coincidence. And I got hundreds of testimonies like that. So it must be given, it must be blessed before it can multiply. Here's the second principle, it's real simple. It must be given away before it can multiply. So what if after Jesus had blessed the five loaves and the two fish, what if the disciples had eaten it themselves? Do you know how many people tithe? They catch that, but they never give over and above. So listen, here's what's amazing. Your finances are actually blessed. They have the potential to multiply, but you never give it to anyone else. You never give it away, but it's blessed. So let me tell you now our testimony for Debbie and me. We, we got married at 18 and 19, young, okay? Uh, nine months later, I get saved. I already told you that first message I ever heard was on tithing. We tithed immediately. I got a raise the next day. God was just trying to encouraged me, hey, you're on the right path. And then the Lord began to speak to us to get our finances in order. He literally said to me in my quiet time one day, I want you to get your finances in order so I can bless them. Now please hear me, this is very important. This is why we have financial classes and things like that, stewardship ministry, things like that, is to help you. Because many people have never been taught how to even do a budget, how to get their finances in order, things like that. And so the Lord said, I want you to get your finances in order so I can bless them. You need to know God cannot bless something that's out of order. So he told me to do three things. This, not me, this may not be the same three things for you, okay? So he first thing he said to me was, get out of debt. Now, that means different things to different people. So, okay, for me, we could keep a mortgage because it was better for, for us, we, I believe, and again, it's whatever God tells you, but to be, when we made a payment, we were actually gaining equity in a home than like try to pay 20 years in an apartment and then buy a home and save up for it. So for us, we, we were able to, we, we had to, he said, get up, pay off all debt for depreciating items, but you can, you can keep a mortgage, okay? So that, again, when I say these principles, it's whatever God tells you. God takes the specifics for you, okay? So we, it took about th two to three years, somewhere around there, and we just paid off everything. I mean, literally, literally. As a matter of fact, during that time, because uh, I, I told Debbie, we're not buying anything that's not an essential, nothing. And her hair dryer broke on one Sunday morning while we're getting ready for church. And literally, it was, she said, it was right when I finished, she said, but I just need you to know, this isn't essential, okay? <laughs> this isn't essential. And so I said, okay, I said, but I said, I feel like we just need to pray and just say, God lead us in what to do. She said, okay, but it is an essential. Before you pray, it's an essential, okay. So I said, okay, well, let's just pray. So we pray. We go to church at Shady Grove. We're just members. We're sitting there worshiping. This lady walks up to Debbie during worship with a Walmart sack. And she said, I was at Walmart yesterday, and I don't know why, but God told me to buy you this. It was a hairdryer. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you do it God's way, it's incredible what God does. 
We, 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 we uh, had a car that was way too expensive for us. We sold that car and bought a car for cash and all we had was $750. But we loved that car. I mean, we loved it. We really did because we were getting our finances in order. We prayed over it. We anointed it with oil about a quarter a week. And we just <laughs> loved that car. And we drove that car because God said, get out of debt. Second thing God said to me was don't manipulate. So I'm in the ministry and I used to have this, and I had a mailing list. And I'd send, uh, you know, uh, letters every month, these people on our mailing list, and they'd send checks. And so the Lord said, I want you to stop the mailing list. Now, I'm not saying you can't have a mailing list, but you need to know is my, is my purpose behind the mailing list, if you're in the ministry, to get money or to inform people of what's going on in the ministry? You just need to know what your motive is because God knows what your motive is. And so I told the Lord, I said, Lord, um, uh, I send the mailing list and people send in donations. And uh, the Lord said to me, well, if I want them to send donations, I'll speak to them. And so I quit and they quit. <laughs> and I said, Lord, um, they're not sending the donations anymore. He said, mm-hmm. He said, I'll take care of you. And so we get in that $750 car. This guy calls me. Another thing the Lord told me was, I was in the ministry full-time. So I was not, and when I say full-time, I was in traveling ministry. So I was not on staff at any church. And when I would go preach, they would give a love offering um, or a like offering um, <laughs> or a don't like offering, don't come back offering, you know. So, um, but, uh, so if it, it, we didn't know what, and if I, didn't, if I wasn't preaching somewhere, you know, we didn't have a check that week. Uh, but the Lord told me, and I used to say, they'd say, what are your financial requirements for coming? And I would say, uh, pay our expenses and give us a love offering. And the Lord said, from now on, you, don't, you say, I have no financial requirements for coming. And so this guy calls me and he says, uh, hey, can you come preach? And I said, uh, yes. And he said, what are your financial requirements for coming? And I said, I have no financial requirements for coming. And he was an older pastor and he'd been in the ministry for a while and he said, what do you mean you have no financial requirements for coming? I said, I have no financial requirements for coming. <laughs> and I remember him saying this, he said, is your father rich? And I said, yes, he is, as a matter of fact. Not talking about him, talking about my heavenly father. Although, by the way, when Debbie and I just so you know, I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag. When Debbie and I had given away our 15th car, he and my mom were giving away their 15th house. So I grew up in giving. I watched a giver my whole life. I knew God blesses givers. So anyway, I said, I have no financial requirements coming. And he said, well, if you came and preached and we didn't give you a love offering, what are you going to do? Just like that. And I said, well, if I come and preach, and, and I meant it right, but it didn't come out right. I don't know if you've ever, that's ever happened to you. But I said, you know, if I come and preach and you don't give me a love offering, I said, well, God will take care of me and God will take care of you. And he said, he's like, well, we'll give you a love offering, brother. We'll give you a love offering. And, and I didn't mean it like that. I just meant God will provide for me and he'll provide for you, you know. And another guy called and said, hey, would you come and preach? And I said, yes. He said, what are your financial requirements? I said, I have no financial requirements. And I remember him saying this, good, because I don't even think we could pay your gas. He didn't even say pay your expenses. He said pay your gas. Here's why that's important, because we got in our little $750 car, and we started driving with the smoke coming out. We never had a problem with mosquitoes, by the way, in our neighborhood. <laughs> but we started driving. And up to Oklahoma is where it was. I stopped, filled it up with gas, went in to pay for it, and the lady behind the counter said, it's taken care of. And I said, what, what do you mean it's taken care of? She said, well, because when you pulled in, God told me I was to fill your car with gas. And I remember going out and I told the Lord, I sure like doing it better your way than my way, God. And God began to miraculously take care of us. And then the third thing God said was give. He said, get out of debt, don't manipulate. And by the way, it's not just for people in the ministry because you can be manipulators too. But the third thing is he said, give. And I said to the Lord, 
I said, well, Lord, I do give, I tithe. Now, I don't mean this wrong, okay? You gotta understand, God and I, we laugh. I say funny things, he says funny things. So I said, Lord, I do give, I tithe. And I felt like the Lord went, <laughs> <laughs> and I, actually, it was more like this, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> and I was like, I, Lord, I give 10%. And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, you don't give 10%, son, you return 10% because it's mine. And you read it all through scripture, I read it for you. He said, the tithe is mine. It belongs to me, it's been set apart for the house of God. So he said, when you give, you give over and love the tithe. So I said to the Lord, well Lord, how will I know where to give, when to give, and how much to give? Now those are three good questions, right? Where to give, when to give, how, how, how much to give? And here's what he said, and listen how simple this is. He said, I'll tell you, my sheep hear my voice, I'll tell you. So not long after that, I went to a church with about 60 people and I had one meeting for the whole month and it wasn't even a Sunday through Wednesday revival, it was a Sunday night youth service. And there were 60 people in attendance, around 60. And I got up and, I, and he said, what are your requirements for coming? I said, I have no financial requirements for coming. He got up after I preached, and he's told the whole church that. He said, I've never had an evangelist tell me I have no financial requirements coming. He said, I want you to give like you've never given before. I want to bless this young man. And so he, the pastor and I are standing at the, down at the front after the service, and the people who counted the offering came and brought a check, you know, and gave it to the pastor. And the pastor looked at it, and he said, look at that. He said, that's more than we've ever given. Look at it. He showed me, look, he, givers are excited to give. And I looked at it and it was our exact budget for the whole month. And the only meeting we had the whole month. And by that time, by the way, we had a, an employee and we had some bills and we had an office, and we had expenses and all. So it was exact for the whole budget for the ministry for the whole month. Because some of the meetings we did were larger meetings. And so um, I just thought it's incredible. And he gives me this check. And he's talking to me and I look over, just glance over his shoulder and there is a missionary standing at the back of the sanctuary that talking to some people that had given his testimony before I preached. And this voice said to me, give him the offering. And I remember exactly what I thought, get behind me Satan. That's, that's, that's not God. That's not God. That's not God. That's not you. That's not you. And, and again, the Lord says, give him the offering. And I remember thinking, you gotta remember now, again, I, I'm, I talk funny to the Lord, he talks funny to me, he doesn't mind, he's not intimidated by us or you know, insecure or anything. And I remember saying, Lord, Lord, you know, you, I, I preached a good message and you got all pumped up and you wanna give to a missionary now, but, but this is exactly what we, for the whole month, and you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm the pastor, he and I are talking, but I'm talking to the Lord, you know, and Lord, we don't, I don't have any other meetings this month, and I, this is crazy, give him the whole offering. The Lord said, I told you I would tell you when to give, where to give, and how much to give, and I'm telling you to give that missionary the whole offering right now. So the building started clearing out. I pulled the check out and endorsed it, folded it in half and went back to the missionary and said, hey, I appreciate what you shared tonight. And the Lord told me to do this. And I said, don't look at this until after you leave because it was a large amount. And I said, and don't ever tell anybody I did this. And I never shared these giving stories back then, but I believe God told me years later, you need to share these now to, to give glory to me. And so I said, don't, tell, don't ever tell anyone that I did this. And so I gave him the check. And Debbie and I walked out and there were some couples in the parking lot. And one of them said, hey, y'all wanna go get some pizza? He said, I'm buying. And I said, yeah. <laughs> As you know, we, we were broke, you know, so yeah. You buying? Yeah, yeah, I feel led of the Lord <laughs> to go. So we go out to eat with these couples. There were six couples, including Debbie and me. So the six guys are sitting at one end of the table talking, you know, and the six ladies are sitting down here. Debbie's all the way at that end. I'm all the way at this end. And these four guys started talking about the football game or something, you know. And this guy who's sitting right across from me looks at me all of a sudden and he kind of leans across the table like that. And so I kind of lean across the table. 
And he says to me, I've only met him one time before. Only one time I'd met him, just met him. And he leans across the table and he says to me, how much was the love offering? Just like that. And so I told him how much it was. And then he said to me, where's the check? Like that. And I know you're not supposed to lie. I know you're supposed to tell the truth. But I really didn't want to say, I gave it to a missionary. That's how spiritual I am, you know, or something. I just didn't, and I got flustered. I didn't know why he was questioning me. And so I just heard myself say, Debbie has it. <laughs> and he said to me, go get it. I want to see it. And so I said, okay. So I got up and I walked down to where Debbie was eating her pizza and I leaned down and I, here's what I said. How's your pizza? Is it good? Okay, good. Because there's nothing else to say. There's no check. So I go back and I sit down and again, I know you're supposed to tell the truth, but I didn't want to say we gave it away. I didn't want anyone to know what we'd done. I wanted it to be in secret, you know, and so I just leaned across and I just said to him, it's in the car. And he said, it's not in the car. And so I said, where is it? Oh, you, you know so much, pal, you know, just, I didn't understand why he was questioning me like that and grilling me like that. And he, then he said to me, you gave it away, didn't you? Just like that, you gave it away. You gave it to that missionary, didn't you? And I said, how do you know that? I said, did you see me? Did you see me? Were you in the church? Just like that. And he said, no, I didn't see you. Now, this guy, by the way, didn't go to that church. He heard I was preaching. And that afternoon, God told him and he wrote a check out. And he said, take him this check. Now remember that the love offering has dollars and cents. An offering has dollars and cents on it. An honorarium is a round amount, like $500 or $1,000 or $250 or something like that. This was an offering, it had dollars and cents. And so he said to me, God told me that you were gonna give the offering away. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a check. And he opened it up like this and he held it out like that. It was exactly 10 times the amount of the check I just given away. 10 times the amount. Dollars and cents. And by the way, this guy goes to our church. A few years ago, I looked out and I saw him and I told him, I said, hey, stand up. Stand up. I said, that's the man right now, right there. And I said, is this true what I'm telling you? What I'm telling you, he said it's true. He verified it just like that. And so anyway, he said, here. So he's holding the top of the check. I reached out, I took the bottom of the check, but he wouldn't let it go. <laughs> and I realized he wanted to say something to me. Now I know he wanted to impart something to me. So anyway, I looked across the top of the check and he said to me, I'm holding the bottom, he's holding the top. Think about the impartation. And he said to me, God's about to teach you about giving so you can teach the body of Christ. And he let the check go. And immediately, here's what came in my heart. I thought, this is God's money. This is God's money. It's not my money. And I can tell you before God that every check I've received since then, I know it's God's money. It's completely known to God. We started because we had almost a year's salary right there. We actually went and bought a car for a single mom and we still had the $750 car. We had a friend that was out of work and we paid his salary for four months until he got a job. We just started giving. We started giving extravagantly. As a matter of fact, I've never even shared this part of it. That year, that year, when we did that, from the rest of that year, for that whole year, we made $150,000. I was 24 years old and we gave 120,000 of it away, 80%. God just began to bless us from everywhere. And then one day, I'm having my quiet time, and the Lord said to me, would you give me everything? This was after we had sold that $750 car, we bought another car, we had two cars, 
We had paid off all of our debt, all of those things. And we had money in the bank. And the Lord said, would you give me everything? And I knew what he meant. He meant personal checking, personal savings, ministry checking, ministry savings, retirement, both cars, and the house. And I remember thinking, Lord, I would love to give you everything. You gave me everything. You gave up everything for me. And so we sat down, Debbie and I, and decided where to give all the funds, where to give the cars, the people that, for the two cars, and then the house. We gave the house to a pastor, had five kids. And by the way, the way we did it, and this has been verified too, is that they said the best way to do it is for the church to buy the house, and then you give the proceeds back to the church, and it'll be a parsonage for the pastor. And so that's what we did. The church bought it from us, but we gave every bit of it back to the church. So we gave everything away. A few days later, I'm reading the most famous story about Solomon in the Bible. <laughs> you know what the famous story about Solomon is, right? God appeared to him and said, ask anything you want. Ask anything you want. Can you imagine God saying that to you? What would you say? Ask anything you want. And so I'm reading about Solomon, and I thought, this is amazing because it says at night the Lord appeared to Solomon. So I wonder what happened that day. What happened that day was he was inaugurated king of Israel. It was uh, tradition, not even scripture, tradition for the king to offer one bull when he was inaugurated. Do you know how many Solomon offered? 1,000. And here's what God said to me. I only say to extravagant givers, ask anything you want. He said, I would never say that to a selfish person or a person who's not a giver because I can't trust them. He said, but I can trust you because you just gave everything. Just like that. And then he said to me, ask. Ask anything you want. And you have to remember that I was very immoral before I accepted Christ. And then I've shared this in a book. I've shared it openly. Debbie shared it in a book. I was immoral after we got married. And Debbie didn't know. And I thought when she finds out, I'm gonna lose my marriage. So I knew what I wanted. I said, Lord, I want for Debbie and I to be passionately in love all the days of our lives. And this year we celebrated 43 years of marriage. That's worth every dollar we've given away more. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. The only reason I preach this series is because I want you to live a blessed life. And the blessed life is not how much you get back. The blessed life is giving. The blessed life is being able to help people and also to have enough to bless your family and to bless others, and not to have to struggle from paycheck to paycheck. And God wants to do it for you, but he has an order in scripture. It starts with the first 10%. And then there are other financial principles, but one of them is then the next thing you do is you give over and above. You give beyond when God tells you to. So what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? I want to pray for you. You know, I feel, keep your, just keep your eyes closed for a minute. I just want to ask you to make a commitment. Every campus, everyone online, will you just, if, if you'll make this commitment, 
Pastor Robert, to the best of my ability, I want to obey the Lord with my finances. Would you just put your hand up? Just everywhere. I mean, it should be, I would think everyone would want to do that. To the best of my ability, I want to obey the Lord with my finances. You can put your hands down. Lord, you saw your sons and your daughters. And God, you encouraged me all along the way. Every step that I took in giving, you encouraged me. You helped me. And it doesn't mean that everything always went right. It doesn't mean that I didn't have times where I had to trust you because that was also what I needed at that time. But I pray for my brothers and sisters. And I pray, Lord, that all of us, to the best of our ability, will obey you with our finances. In Jesus' name.